feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome. Since we've been live for a little bit and experiencing uh, minor technical difficulties, welcome to the shrimp tank. We come to you every week, uh, both myself, your co-host, Ted Jenkins, and of course, Lee Heisman with me. And we're having our guest we're going to bring in today, Casey Carter. Uh, he runs a tremendous business. We're going to talk all about marketing and much, much more today. And on the Shrimp Tank every week, we like to talk to some of the brightest and best CEOs and business owners in and around the city of Atlanta, the state of Georgia, and across the United States. And the Shrimp Tank has been blown up. Uh, we literally recently just signed the entire state of Tennessee to start doing the Shrimp Tank at the beginning of 2021. But we're in Seattle and Los Angeles and Houston and Little Rock, Arkansas, Harrisburg, Charleston, Boca Raton, Boston, and many cities, including the territory north in Canada, uh, going up to uh, British Columbia, and we're going to be all over uh, Canada as well. Entrepreneurship is thriving around the world, but people love to talk about it. So what we do every week right here on the Shrimp Tank is this combination of book smarts and street smarts. It's what helps us be able to take zero dollars we have today and turn them into literally millions of dollars down the road. Look, you can take an MBA course on this, but that's not going to teach you really how to do it. It's our business owners that are going to really teach you how to make this happen. As always, you can get a replay of all of our broadcasts at Trim Tank Podcast, <clears throat> excuse me, dot com. You can go to iHeartRadio, uh, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or anywhere around the internet. Lee, what's shaking today before we bring in uh, Kaysen? Sure. Well, Ted, you know, you and I have been privy and I think it was around the country that we've been using a service, Ted, for many years. I think every, nearly every entrepreneur that you and I have talked to about it uh, were shocked and started looking into it, a service called Clutch, in which you didn't uh, own a vehicle, right? And we've been, you and I have been doing this for over three years where we didn't own a vehicle, Ted, and we would utilize an entire inventory of over 40 cars, different shapes and sizes, all different manufacturers. We would not pay insurance. We would not have to pay for any maintenance. We simply would, and one of the greatest parts is flip the cars, Ted. So when you and I were a member for Clutch and, and they sold recently the Mercedes, you and I would be in appointments and we would set a flip and we would be actually performing or, or participating in, a, in, in an appointment. Somebody would come to your vehicle. They would remove all of your personal belongings from your vehicle, put it into the new vehicle, come into the office or wherever you were and hand you the key. How nice and fun was that, Ted, when you were doing it? It was brilliant. It was a brilliant model. We used to get Fords, Jaguars, BMWs, Mercedes, convertibles, whatever it is that you wanted, any day that you wanted. That's why I love that program so much. And for a busy entrepreneur, what was so good about the program was I didn't have to deal with maintenance. I didn't have to go do an, a, an oil change or, or a tire change or a brake job or any damage. You simply would just move on with your day. And then they sold the Mercedes, and recently, Ted, by August 14th, Mercedes has canceled. They, they've claimed it's a COVID thing, but they've canceled their program. Now, I know I went out and ended up getting a Tesla. Ted, what is your plan? Because I know you've been looking at the Rivian, which is a wonderful car. You and I met the CEO yeah. and went to a private event there. But you have a lot of these electric vehicle options, and the Rivian is the first SUV electric vehicle. Lee, You've I've, only got two weeks. What are you going to do? I ended up buying a small school bus. I bought one of those half school buses. So. Yellow? The short, the short bus? Yeah. Excellent. I'm a man around town here in Atlanta, Lee, so I needed something where people would notice me, and I thought maybe I'd get a Bentley or maybe I would get a Lambo or get a Tesla, and I said, who's going to forget me when I have a half of a school bus, one of the short buses? I like that. Well, knowing you, Ted, and if anybody knows Ted, I will guarantee you that yellow bus will soon be blue with an Oxygen Breathe Either logo all over it. And most importantly, Ted, more than likely, you probably will put your logo across the top of it so people in the buildings above you are looking down at the street and can see your logo. Of course, I even have blue fur going inside the bus and everything like that, like from our- That's how Mike Felberg in the fur bus. You're referencing Mike. Yeah. So have you decided, Ted, prior to us beginning and bring our guest in, I know this is a big quantity for you and you, I know your lack of commitment that you, you don't wanna have to commit again, but eight, August 14th, you're going to have to make a decision. What is the vehicle you're leaning so towards? What, what I did, and I will tell you, business owners that have never looked at subscription programs, this is a huge thing in your P&L when you net net it out. And Lee and I have done this and net out the cost of insurance and you net out the cost of maintenance and just the time that you would spend in a dealership. I'm still Lee at either the Rivian. I put a down payment on the new Ford Broncos. I don't know if I'm yes. going to go that route. Or I may go, I may go for the Uber Duber Tesla Model X. Uh, I'll get it matted so I don't look too hoodie, but you know, hoodie enough. And so 
Fair, fair. Well, Ted, I, I did just receive my ex and they're finishing the wrap now. So what I'll do is I'll leave it with you for a week and help you make that decision. All right. You're going to let me drive it? Of course I would. Why not? It drives itself, doesn't it? it yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly correct. Well, I tell you what, business owners, you're, you're in for a treat today. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to bring in our guest, Case and Carter. Um, it's really interesting because you may have seen this before, but every once in a while you turn on the TV, you're watching ESPN or you're watching one of these channels and an ad comes up and something may have actually happened tragically to your family that somebody got cancer or somebody got a, a certain disease and there's a firm saying, hey, we're, we're going to help, help you together, uh, put together a bunch of people and talk to these companies to see if we can justify right from wrong and get these cases solved. And you always wonder who does all the back end of, of trying to get those people together to some of the best attorneys in the country and then letting those attorneys do what they do and try those cases against some of the larger companies in America. And Kaysen's firm, Broughton Partners, is one of the biggest and best in the entire industry of marketing for uh, legal firms for these specific cases, uh, they, these mass tort cases that can take many, many years to settle in court. And um, really just a, a brilliant at, at uh, marketing. So, uh, Kaysen, thanks for joining us today. I know you're joining us from down in Savannah. Uh, for those thanks of you for having who have been me. down in Savannah, I got to tell you, it's, it's a, not only is it a great place to visit, I mean, it's just a great place to live, beautiful part of the country. Um, but how did you actually, you know, I know that you studied business at college and how did you actually get into the business of wanting to do marketing and specifically marketing for law firms? You know, it was by half a chance. Um, at the end of the day, I was, um, working in a software company in Atlanta that was advertising or marketed to, um, personal injury attorneys. And, um, during the time that market was going well, didn't quite have um, everything we needed to grow the business at that time. And somebody, uh, one of the people that I was calling on to sell the software to said, look, I figured out how to market for my law firm. Why don't we see if we can deliver leads through your system? And so that was the grand idea, right? In the beginning was let's deliver leads through the software in order to get it to attorneys for them to work on. And at the end of the day, um, attorneys being on different softwares and some of the tech um, downfalls there, it kind of turned into really quickly, let's deliver leads to attorneys. Um, and one of the biggest things that happened, one of the biggest pivot points in the business was right off the bat, we started delivering leads to these attorneys and we could hear the phone calls because we made it a must that they get on tracking software where we could listen to the calls because we said, we can't optimize marketing unless we get the feedback from what's going on on the calls. During the first couple of calls, during the first couple of weeks of the campaigns, we're just hearing people not call people back within um, 48 hours. We hear people pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm in the middle of the meeting, let me get back to you later. Really quickly, we discovered that our business model was not gonna work unless we pivoted. And we said, well, in order to pivot, we should set up a call center, we'll work on behalf of the law firm and take that caller turn it into a sign retainer to them for them and deliver it to them and let them do what they're good at being a lawyer and not have to worry about intake and the marketing for the cases. And that was the big pivotal turning point for us. Um, and that's really what's made us different is the ability not only to take the marketing, but turn that marketing into a client for them. And so we really handle it from start to finish and turn key. And it really works out for a lot of lawyers because they're not looking to do intake. They're not looking to do the marketing. And most companies that they deal with are marketing companies or an intake company. And when you have the two separate, it makes it impossible for the feedback between the two. And you also have an intake company who's trying to get um, their money by signing up cases. And you have a marketing company who's saying our leads are good. Well, if the intake company just signs all of the, you know, the easy calls and doesn't really rework the calls that they should, the marketing spend goes down if the intake company is working all the calls that they should and they're working on cost per, per, per performance, then they're not getting the revenue they should because they're having to rework leads so hard. And so it's really a perfect mix bringing the two together for us. And that's really been the key to success for us. Well, Jason, so, you know, you mentioned something very key for entrepreneurs, which is pivoting, right? You started the business, you noticed an angle, and then you noticed you had to pivot. But, but let's take it a step 
further back, if you don't mind. Because yeah. you spoke about the fact that you were working for a firm in Atlanta, and there was a bigger pivot in your life when you actually started this business. So a lot yeah. of our listeners, you know, they see you, a young man, of course, or maybe an old man who's just aged very well. You know, that's, <laughs> that, that's a picture of you, Ted, possibly. But uh, they see a young man like you, and, you know, where was the pivot? Tell us a little bit about the journey from, I worked for that firm in Atlanta, and then I realized I want to make a pivot and open up this other firm. Yeah, you know, as an entrepreneur myself, I think that, you know, failures lead to success. And I think you have to be willing to fail, fail quickly, learn from it and pivot. And that's something I tell my team all the time. And I try to encourage an atmosphere of failure because an atmosphere where people don't fail is an atmosphere where people don't move, right? They're too scared to make a decision. They are, you know, they are basically stuck in this situation where if I make a decision and it's wrong, then I'm going to be reprimanded. I try to promote a culture of let's make a decision, make it quick and learn from it. And so for me, I'd started 20 different businesses or so by the time I was about 26 years old. The biggest factor for me of why none of those ever worked out, none of them were bad ideas per se, but it was the all in mindset that I had with this one. It was the, I can't go back mindset. And when you put your back against the wall and say, there's no turning back, you make sure that it's going to be the one that works. And so when I pivoted into this one, I knew that there was enough model there that it would, it could work and that it was possible to work. And then I put myself all in, but you have to be willing to pivot because um, I think all the death of a lot of really good ideas are the ones that people are so set on the model that they have in their mind from the beginning and not realizing, well, if I took this model and did this with it, if I took this model and spun it out in a different way, and maybe I don't do the full model. Maybe I do half the model. You have to be willing to pivot to meet your customers' demands, and the customer drives everything. How do you uh, how do you manage today a, a fail fast culture? Because that's what I'm hearing you say is like I, I want to do it, and I want to fail fast. And a lot of entrepreneurs are always waiting to get an A product and then take it to market, as opposed to taking a C product to market and then figuring out how to make it an A. So how do you how do you promote that fail fast culture? Well, you do it in a couple of ways. One, you don't reprimand anybody. You don't put too much pressure on them when they fail, as long as they are putting the systems in place to monitor it. And so when it happens, I try not to focus on what they did wrong. I try to focus on let's not make that mistake again, right? 5% of my time I try to spend on what happened. 95% of my time I try to spend on the solution if something goes wrong. And I try to tell my team that. And so anytime that they're coming up with new ideas, anytime they're um, bouncing new ideas off of me, I always say, let's set up a way to monitor it. Let's pivot when we need to. But at the end of the day, don't make the same mistake twice. That's just, that's where you become, you know, that's insanity. So, Jason, do you have those other 19 businesses still, or is this your main focus? This is my only focus at this point, right? Uh, you know, it was little things popping up here and there that I was moonlighting as I was still selling and things like that. Um, but, you know, I started a lawn care business when I was in high school and did really well. And we pivoted really quickly. We were doing in residential lawns. And then this was in 2006 as developments were going crazy. And we got an opportunity from a land developer who had like 15 subdivisions. And he said, instead of doing lawns, I want you to do the right of ways for my subdivision. So we quickly had to tell all the residential customers we had, we'll phase you out. But at the end of the day, we took it over and we went straight commercial development and um, we're servicing these land developers and it worked out really well for us. But go, go back to this. You know, I've seen, I have so many friends in your general age category that are entrepreneurs and I've noticed that they've been stymied by having too many businesses, just like you said, right? And, and I consistently give advice to these young, vibrant CEOs and entrepreneurs that, you know, if you're not focusing on one thing, it's never going to be truly successful. Where, where, when did you have that aha moment that I just need to focus on this business because you can have 19 semi-successful businesses, but you're not going to do it until you really just focus on one. I see that a lot with entrepreneurs. Tell our listeners, when was that aha moment? And, and please express obviously the success you had with that. Yeah. The, so anytime you say yes to anything, you say no to something else. And that's what you have to get your mindset in whether that's no to something else in the business that you're working on currently, whether that's no to something in your personal life. And you have to always understand that opportunity cost. I had that aha moment when I started this business of starting to catch a little bit of success. And then as an entrepreneur, you know, I have shiny object syndrome sometimes too, 
but I got really good at saying no because every time I said no, I said yes to something in my business. And so I had that moment of, okay, we're gaining traction, we're gaining traction. You saying no to so many things is what's helping you gain traction. And so you have to be all in on something and have to be focused on something. And I think the, the, everyone sees these great entrepreneurs, Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, Grant Cardone, um, Ted Jenkin, all these people online everywhere, right? And they have all these businesses and they say, I want to be like that person. The way those people got there, in my opinion, they were very, very niche. When that market is very niche in the beginning, when you think a market could be too big, it's too big. That's from Peter Till's book um, that I'm reading right now. He says, if you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. So start with the smallest possible market you can. Get very good at that and then expand off of what you do in other byproduct areas, but keep it within the same line of business you have. We've just now started to branch off a little bit into other areas. We're four years in and we have 130 people and we're just now starting to test a little bit of other markets. And that's because we wanted to stay very niche until we have a proven model and get good at what we were good at. So to all those entrepreneurs out there, very niche in the beginning, stay niche, stay niche, stay niche. The way those people got to where they had 20 different businesses is they had the infrastructure set up, they had the team set up, and they had the resources. They didn't get there by starting themselves so thin in the beginning where they couldn't concentrate on one thing. I assure you. I, I want to talk about two things in here. Um, let's just talk first about leads because there are a lot of businesses that go out and generate leads, but they actually don't have a system or a methodology about how to convert the leads, which are two very distinct things. And I remember when I had met you and, and it was a, actually an epiphany for me, even though it was right in front of my face that I think you said something like if a lead doesn't get called in the first five minutes or 10 minutes, the, the fall off on how difficult it is to convert the lead, it's just, it's just um, huge. So how, is that important for businesses to have a system to get them called that quickly? So the statistic is, and it was from Inside Sales, um, and I could share it with you all if you wanted to publish it, but they tested, I think, 3 million leads. And they wanted to see what the time frame to call those leads back. And so we're talking about web submission forms. We're not talking about live calls, which is drastically the way everybody's turning to nowadays, right, is web submission leads. Um, what the difference was in the callback times. The callback times were if you didn't call the lead back within five minutes, the chance of closing it was 90% less. The idea behind that is, is if they're submitting a form for you online and you don't call them back, they'll be really quick to submit it for someone else. And so you have to be very quick about how you call everyone back. Our goal internally is 30 seconds. We have software set up to do that it drastically changes your conversions because a lead is only good is only as good as how you handle that lead. Now, Lee, I want to tell you something here and I'm going to let Kaysen chime in on this because um, sometimes when you hear what, some, what someone like Kaysen is saying, entrepreneurs could be watching this and say, I call bullshit. You know, that's not the way that it is. But I had all these leads here at Oxygen and I said, I tell you what, all my guys say the people aren't home, they won't answer. And Kaysen did a little test for me even. And we looked at a couple of people in his office who knew nothing about financial planning at all. And we got a script together for him and Lee, they started calling the leads and we got like 60 appointments in the first <laughs> month. Oh my gosh. From so wait, are you, are you ultimately saying other than learning more about Kaysen's business and, and how it thrives, are you telling me in addition to that, not to trust your own employees? Is that what you're saying, Ted? Yeah, I don't anymore. I don't trust any of them. Not one damn one of them I don't trust. Yeah, I was going to say, Kazen, do you have a case study of how many people you've gotten fired by being successful for your clients? Uh, no, I do not. I do not want to keep that case study on record. But um, we have had a lot of uh, law firms that used to try to run intake departments. If you don't run an intake department well, if you're not 24-7, if you don't have the software set up to call people back within um, under five minutes, if you don't have a system to prioritize who you're calling back at the right time and a good way to keep track of that, um, it's really hard to do uh, to convert leads. And so we've had a lot of law firms that said, I'm done with my marketing department. I'm done with buying outside marketing. I'm done with my intake department um, because of this. Um, 
this model. And so our goal is to take all the service industries out there and grow into them where we take it from not just a lead, but we take a lead and we turn it into a client for them. Because when you talk about leads, leads are supposed to get clients. Everybody's always so set on, oh, I did generated this many leads. How many clients did you get? It's cost per client. That's all that matters. Yeah. But, and a lot of companies don't have those systems. And I, I wanted to, to talk about this because I think it's interesting, you know, I have a lot of employees and Lee, Lee does too, but you with a hundred plus employees and you haven't built out this massive call center, I always wonder about this idea of managing consistency. Like how do you actually manage the consistency of that call center and getting people to try to produce a, a similar result? Yeah, you have to build out, you know, I'm such a big believer in processes. I mean, to a T that are repeatable and, um, everything from their first week of training to their second week of training is built out and we tweak it and it's documented and it's well drawn out. And then how many leads they should be touching a day, how many calls they should be making a day is watched on a daily basis. And their trainers are working with them. How can you get better here? How can you convert more? How can you do, um, uh, do those things? And so we're top heavy in the sense that I think we have for about 70 intake reps, we have about um, 10 or 12 right now managers um, and trainers and shift supervisors. And that's all meant to make sure that they are keeping their quality where they need to be continuously training, 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 training. And so we build processes out for training. We build processes out for quality assurance. We grade calls every single day. And it's a repeatable model once you get it built out correctly, but you have to find that repeatable model that works. And until you find that repeatable model that works, you don't know if you can convert 20 leads in every hundred or if you can convert five leads in every hundred. You have to build that repeatable model and watch it daily with metrics. So let me ask you a question, Casey. It's, it's important, you know, pre-COVID, we had some of the lowest unemployment numbers record setting in what, decades, right? Ten years to decades, of course. Three and a half percent, you know, is the lowest we had in 50 Terribly years. Terribly low. Yep. So finding pre-COVID, finding your quality employees and staff, I, I've always felt, and I know I talked to other CEOs and entrepreneurs, it has been difficult. Have you seen a trend since post-COVID? It's not post-COVID, but in the middle of COVID, pre-COVID, and we'll call it COVID. Are you finding an employment issue? Is it easier to find quality staff? Is it harder? What, what is the trend you're seeing? It's definitely easier to find quality staff now. Um, now, my biggest focus, though, every single day is culture. I believe culture drives a business. I believe mindset drives a business. I tell everybody that um, from day one, I focus on culture more than I focus on anything else. Um, and so we were always good about finding people because we had a fun place to work, a good place to work, one that was uh, everyone has a voice. Everyone has an idea on how we can get better. And I want everybody's ideas on how we can get better. Um, and we pay people fair and well for the positions they're in. And we always try to do that um, so that we can get good people. So we were able to build a, a very good team pre COVID, but we've hired about 30 people during COVID. We made a promise not to lay anyone off. Um, you know, that's one of those, when you talk about culture, everybody thinks, well, free lunches and, you know, uh, I want to make sure that everybody gets to wear jeans on Friday. That's not culture. Culture is people knowing they care about you. People, culture is I will bend over backwards to work uh, and help you get through your situation and you do it for me. Culture is caring about their success, their progression plan, where they want to be in life and really just loving your employees and caring about them and making sure that you're doing everything to put them above anyone else. And so we made a promise as a part of our culture, we were not going to lay anyone off. That, I think, went so far with the team we had and has allowed us to grow during this time. And we've actually been able to hire 30 people during this time. And we've hired some really good talent during this time. And so we're on the hunt for good talent all the time. But when something like this happens and a lot of good talent is out there that maybe not have been before, um, we're definitely taking advantage of that. You know, the, the, uh, we said this before on the shrimp tank before when we talked to um, CEOs and owners of companies, but sometimes they say the only ships that sink are partnerships. Uh, how do you feel about partnerships having, you know, been in one or pros and cons that you could share with fellow entrepreneurs? Partnerships are great when you have the right partner. They really are, right? When you have someone you can collaborate with, work with, and count on, they're great. Someone who 
shows up and puts it all on the line every day and cares about the success of your team just as much as you do. And you have to be so aligned from what you feel about culture, um, how you want to grow the business, where you want to go. It's so important, but it's so important that you have the same mindset from a work ethic standpoint, what you're expecting of each other. And those expectations have to be drawn out and laid out. Uh, laid out. And I actually encourage anyone who's looking at partnerships, lay out what the expectations are for each side of the business and building contingencies based off of those types of things. If this isn't done, then these things will change, right? Salaries will be changed. Equity can be changed based off of contribution, right? Like if certain metrics aren't met, you can build in ways to handle those types of things. And so partners can be awful and I've been in awful relation, partner relationships. You gotta do your due diligence on partners and I really think trial runs are the way to accomplish that. I really do. Just jumping in bed with people and saying we're partners is never the best approach. Kind of like dating, Ted, right? You don't want to get married or have a, you know, you want, to, you want to date a little bit longer so you can kind of see while someone's in the honeymoon phase. Go ahead, Ted. I was just going to say, you know, that, that, that's a whole thing in a lot of businesses with employees or partners is that happiness is about expectations met or unmet. And, and if you don't set expectations at all, you're more often than not going to be unhappy than you will be happy because you've got your own expectations in your head. Somebody else has their own expectations and those, those paths never really, uh, they never really cross at all. How are you, how are you managing your environment today? Uh, given that we're in this coronavirus and everyone being remote, how are you, how are you managing that? Yeah, we've, we've, uh, we put a offsite culture committee in um, really quickly because culture committee. culture committee, I know I like that. So uh, they meet weekly to talk about how we can keep the culture going um, from afar. Uh, you know, vision and mission is what drives our business. We have everybody focus on vision and mission all the time, why we're here, why we do what we do. And this team is united around creating a world without corporate negligence, which is our vision. And so we've had to shift to a lot of things of hope making slack posts i do a lot of one minute videos um daily and send it out to everyone in the company about the successes we're having we've done an increase in town halls that we had before but now we're doing a lot more we're doing a lot more lunch and learns via webex we're doing check-ins I, I make calls to everyone in the company um you know once every two months text messages um routinely to everyone in the company and all of our leaders are expected to do that as well and it's set up on a cadence hey have you made a call to everyone in the comp uh, everyone in your department over the last uh, month? And it has to be scheduled. We check in on that because mental um, mental state of mind right now is my biggest concern. Is everything's going on right now? And so my leaders have to be checking in on their teams during this time consistently, including myself. And I have to walk the walk and talk the talk, or um, or they're just not, you know, if they're not doing that, then, you know, I'll find someone who can, but they've been really great at doing that. So, Kason, I keep taking us back to those pivotal points in your life, you know, prior, pre-business year. You know, at your, at your uh, vibrant young age, to be this successful and to have this type of foresight and just listening to you speak, give me one of your biggest, most influential people in your life that has helped guide you and kind of turn, turn this mentality and kind of kickstart just your, your attitude on how your approach life in my personal life, or would you, or you say someone, a role model, a uh, role model, personal and business. I mean, I think things, we, we talk about this all the time. You know, the person that you are in work, you're probably not that far removed from the person that you are individually as well. Uh, so really maybe your biggest uh, personal influence and then your biggest professional influence. We all know Ted's our biggest professional influence since we met him, of course, on my own many years ago. I know you feel that way, but other than Ted, Go to your biggest personal influence and then your biggest professional. I think uh, my the, the biggest personal would probably be, even though we don't talk that much about the things that we do, is my, is my father from the standpoint of my dad's not uh, the same mindset as me as grow, 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 grow. He's happy where he's at and happy with what he has, but he was always really good about a culture of, you need to take your kids, uh, you know, family first. You need to go to, to the doctor today, take your kids. That's more important than this work. I, I will, I'll cover for you. Um, you know, you're late because of this happening. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to be micromanaging a, a view of that standpoint. And so 
I saw how willing his employees were that he had to lay everything on the line for him because of his mindset of, look, family first, faith first, and then and then this workplace, right? And so try to get those priorities in line. And I think that everybody has to have that. Anybody who works for someone who, you know, their kids are sick and they're not gonna let them go take care of their kids, that's not a place they wanna work, nor is that how I would ever wanna be treated, right? And so for me, um, I think that that would be the personal um, side of things. The uh, professional side, someone who's always, that I've, that talks about culture all the time is, is Gary Vaynerchuk talks about how the second person in line to him is his CHO, Chief Happiness Officer, because nowadays we're entering an era where people care about more than money, more than, uh, more than you know, what, uh, what their t- job title is. They care about what impact they're making on the world. They care about how happy they are at work, how much like, they like coming to work, and that's culture, right? Do people want to show up to work or do people dread showing up to work? that's your culture. Yep. I was wondering, you know, you, you know, I've met a lot of these uh, personal injury attorneys and their personalities could be larger than life for sure. Yeah. Uh, Who would you say is the most insane, you know, out of the box personal injury attorney that you've known and and met? Because we see these guys on the strong arm of the law and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Uh, Hammer, you know, who's the, who's the craziest one you've met as of yet? Um, you know, there's a lot. Uh, Jim Onder comes to mind. He's one of a uh, really close friend. He's just larger than life and uh, does some incredible things, but he's, he's not crazy in the sense that he knows what he's doing and he figures out how to get the job done. But I love his, uh, I love his spirit and I love his attitude. And then another one is my good friend, Anthony Johnson, who has mentored me a lot on the tech side of things, how to think about things different and don't just fall into the box of what everybody says that you should be doing figure out how to think outside the box because maybe every idea on earth, you know, there's, there's people out there that says every idea on earth has already been come up with. I'm not personally one of those people, but you know, regardless, a lot of good ideas are taken at this point. Let's get used to it. How do you expand on those ideas, make them better? How do you get better at those things? Anthony's always had that approach and I love that about him. And so he's very out of the box. He does some of the oddest, craziest things that work from social media standpoint. Like, um, you know, he, created a shirt for it was an internal call stop bullying any if you uh commented on his and it, you know it's how is that related to his law firm I, I don't know that it is stop bullying the johnson firm uh if you commented on like the social media post he would send it to you no matter where you were in the country all you had to do was get the uh, get the shirt put it on take a picture of yourself that has done so many great things from him and it's a personal issue for him that he wants to take on and it's just been a larger than life idea that I think is incredible. And so I love those ideas that are just not thought about yet that people take on and they run yeah. at it. Is it true that then I think this is really going to set the tone for business owners that are out there that some of these personal injury attorneys will spend $20 million a year or more in marketing alone. And that the Google keyword for running ads, a personal injury attorney, is the most expensive keyword that's out there for generating leads? I think mesothelioma is, which falls in the category uh, of personal injury attorneys, is the most expensive keyword on earth, has been for years. And it's crazy the budgets that they are are putting into advertising um, because it's all about acquisition branding and bringing those in and everybody sees them in their city and i don't think people realize this as much as probably what they do you see it in your city and like you think man that person's probably nationwide doing this most of these things are very because of the fact that you have to be a lawyer to own a percentage of a law firm and you have to have a bar oh, card crap is that that's bs yeah outside money hasn't made it in yet like private equity money hasn't made it into that industry yet so these are all segmented across the nation. The person you're seeing typically running on your TV, there's a different one just like that in the next city over and the next city over and the next city over. And so it's all over the place and they're out there. And, um, you know, there's a lot of firms out there that are doing a lot of really good things for people that deserve justice um, in this country. And they spend a lot of money to do it because of how competitive the market is. So, Jason, I have a good question. I know we're getting near the end, Ted, but I've got to ask this one. I keep taking you back, if you notice. Yeah, I love absolutely. the business model. I, I, know, 
I know Ted, uh, Ted knows your business and marketing very, very well. I want to know more about the entrepreneur, but you seem very obviously self-reflective. You seem very humble, but give me in the past few years of your business, what, what is one of the largest disappointments, the areas that maybe you let yourself down and you learned from over the past few years? Yeah, I think that there's been, uh, there's a lot of those, right? Um, and, you know, I try to learn from it and not dwell on it and move on. I think that we learn a lot more and we do, as a society, we dwell on what we did wrong more than what we did right. And what's the I, one that you have had a tough time letting go of? Um, there's been, there's been quite a few. The phone system switch that we did last year, I am, obviously you can tell very aggressive and the fact of fail, fail quick. I want to move. I want to move. I want to move. Um, I pulled the trigger. I went live. I pushed the button to go live on the new phone system about a month and a half too early. And I put our intake team in a lot of uh, bad situations or not bad situations. I put them through a lot of um, turmoil, a lot of um, issues that came up, a lot of things that could have been solved if maybe I was a little more patient. And so I spent the next month and a half, um, you know, not only working around the clock to try to figure it out with our tech team how to get it fixed, but also apologizing, hey, stick with me through this. I promise we're going to get it figured out and just constantly telling them, I'm sorry, I made this mistake. Stick with me. We'll get through it. And uh, it's the ones that you make the mistake on that really been or hurt other people that, that bother you, especially when you're trying to build culture. And so that one for me was just a real slap in the face because it was something that I felt like could have been avoided that I um, just moved too quick because I was, you know, uh, should have been playing better. And we've put measures in place actually since then on when to know to implement new software, when to press go live and things like that. Our CTO learned from that. We talked about it and we have new measures in place, but uh, the ones that you heard other people with, those are the ones that you remember the most, I think. Yeah, and that's a great piece of advice for our listeners out there because, you know, Kaysen speaks so eloquent, Kaysen. It sounds like you have everything easy, right? And we as entrepreneurs know it's not. Uh, yeah, but it's to not hear those easy. struggles, yeah, to hear yeah. those struggles and also to not make the same mistake twice. So it sounds like you're, you're in line to have that process set up where you're not making the exact same mistake twice. Yeah, that's something you always want to avoid. And uh, like you just said, entrepreneurship is lonely. It is something that can be, you can get very down. You've got nights where you're working by yourself to hours. Sometimes I think people that are trying to become entrepreneurs need to understand when they're a number two, when they're a number three, and they need to add to the team. Your strengths are your strengths, and you can work on your weaknesses, but really exploit your strengths and find people who complement your strengths. Add those people to the team. Add them around you, maybe not in a partnership role like we just talked about, but figure out how to bring in people that complement your strengths and add to your strengths. You don't want to get two people that are just alike running a business because then who's watching the stuff that you're weak at? Well, for folks that are watching here and there may be attorneys around the country that are saying, hey, why don't I have these guys so I can double or triple my revenue? Uh, how can folks get in touch with you, learn more about your company and what you can do to help their, their law firm? Yeah, absolutely. Broughtonpartners.com. Um, is where they can find our website and personally get a hold of me at um, Kaysen at getcases.com, G E T C A S E S.com, C A S O N at getcases.com, or call my cell. Any entrepreneur out there, I take calls all the time from people that just want to talk, 706 835 5124. I love talking with anybody who wants to talk about business and help out any way I can. Is it true that? Savannah does have the best St. Patty's Day pre-COVID. It is, it is the best? I haven't been to Chicago, so I can't say it's the best. I heard Chicago and Boston are up there, but it's wild. I mean, it's insane. I think it's something like 600,000 people flood into the city. The parade's incredible. Atmosphere is incredible. Um, probably not a place you want to have your kids after the parade, but uh, it's a good time. And is there really a garden of good and evil? Is there a garden of good and evil? Is there actually one? I don't know. I have not found that yet. I need to find that. <laughs> so, Ted, how about we make this deal? Case and I'll make this deal. We, we, we get some type of progress with COVID this year. Maybe things happen in a positive way regarding the phase three trials that they're working on now, their first phase three trials. And by March 17th, is that correct? March 17th of next year, Ted, if 
If yeah. things are safe and sound, we make a trip out there and, and enjoy St. Patty's Day. Y'all come stay with me. We're going to have a great time. Absolutely. That's a must. We'll do it, Lee. Perfect. And I promise that if we get there, I will pay for the initial par for all of us and we'll make it a St. Pappy's Day before the St. Patty's Day. We'll get us four or five Pappy Van Winkles and we'll just sit and we'll go through it. All right. So Guys, I'll side note, Ted, that happens to be my wedding anniversary. So I will be bringing the wife along with me. I probably couldn't go without her. Absolutely. Everyone's invited. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, well, Kaysen, thanks so much for joining us on the Shrimp Tank today. Folks, check out a replay of this entire uh, video that we did today and also as broadcast at shrimptankpodcast.com. It's the other place to get in touch with them as well. As well, attorneys out there in America, I'm telling you, I know this because I've seen it firsthand. I have been in that shop. These are the guys that you want marketing for your law firm. They're the best in the business. Kaysen, thanks so much again for joining us today on the Shrimp Tank. And next week, folks, we're going to have on Kevin Simpson. He's the chief investment officer of something called Capital Wealth Planning. They have a strategy, by the way, where they're using options to figure out how you can make more in your money. We want to learn about that and how he's running that business that's growing like crazy. All next week, right here on the Shrimp Tank. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank.